Uh, so my name is Robert Moss. I'm a assistant staff member at uh, MIT Lincoln Laboratory over in Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, Lincoln Laboratory is a federally funded research and development center. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about how we've utilized Julia um, as a specification language uh, for our next generation airborne collision avoidance system. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about some background on collision avoidance uh, to get you up to speed and then cover um, why we've chosen Julia as the language for our specification document itself. Uh, then uh, talk about how we've incorporated Julia in our simulation frameworks and show some benchmarks with that. And then lastly, we want to talk about other applications throughout the program, um, specifically verification and validation tools. Uh, but before I begin, I want to thank uh, these organizations who've helped um, contribute to these slides directly. Uh, the entire project is funded by uh, the FAA. So I want to thank them for their uh, sponsorship for, um, for the whole project. And a lot of this work um, comes from my colleagues at Lincoln Laboratory and our collaborators at uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, or APL. And um, uh, I'll show you some examples from Michael Kogendifer's uh, laboratory at Stanford, which is the Intelligent Systems Laboratory. Uh, they've been working closely with Carnegie Mellon University uh, at Silicon Valley and uh, NASA to develop some stress testing um, frameworks that I'll I'll talk about at the end. Uh, so to give you a little background, um, in the 1950s, there was a series of mid-air collisions, um, this one in particular over the Grand Canyon, uh, that led to some uh, press frenzies, congressional hearings, as well as the establishment of the FAA in 1958. Um, the FAA put in place some procedures to help reduce mid-air collisions, um, but there was still a need for an onboard system. Um, as you can see, these two in particular, one in, uh, well, they're both in um, California, but one in the 70s and one in the 80s, uh, those resulted um, in Congress realizing that there was a need for this extra um, safety net. And what an onboard collision avoidance system does is it um, protects against failures in uh, air traffic control, uh, protects against failures uh, for visual see and avoid, as well as uh, for the uh, pilot compliance with um, what air traffic control told them to do. Uh, so now we uh, have evolved to a layered architecture for collision protection. Uh, on the scale of hours, you have a strategic airspace design. So if aircraft are flying east to west, uh, they're going to be expected to fly at a certain altitude layer. And uh, flying west to east, they're expected to fly at a different altitude layer. Uh, so that scale uh, on hours reduced mid-air collisions quite a bit. Uh, and then air traffic control, which is more on the scale of minutes. Um, they're around terminal areas where they actually tell the aircraft um, that there's traffic in the area and they'll vector them around other aircraft. Um, but where collision avoidance systems uh, that are onboard the aircraft come into play is in the last minute of an encounter um, when an intruding aircraft is coming in. And this is when latency of information between the pilot and air traffic control uh, can be catastrophic. So an onboard collision avoidance system is necessary for us to uh, meet these desired criteria in safety. So right now, there's a system called TCAS, which stands for the Traffic Alert Collision Avoidance System. Uh, it's mandated worldwide on all uh, commercial aircraft above a certain uh, passenger capacity. And so the, the basic structure of TCAS, um, it has a surveillance portion, which will detect intruders, uh, track their position. It'll send that to a rule-based uh, set of advisory logics. What that'll do is under a certain alerting criteria, uh, it'll assess uh, an optimal action for the pilot to take to avoid the other aircraft. And then that action gets sent to a pilot display. Um, and I'll show you an example of a, a typical pilot or a typical encounter that uh, you would see in the airspace. Uh, so this is a video. On the right, you can see the pilot display. Uh, the white triangle is uh, aircraft nearby. Um, and if that triangle comes within a certain horizontal range, uh, then it'll actually uh, turn yellow and uh, it'll not only, well, it'll enunciate uh, traffic in the area. So the pilots uh, at that point um, should be prepared to do some action, but they also should try to acquire uh, the other aircraft visually. So if that aircraft, even if you've acquired it visually and the aircraft is still um, coming into your safety bubble, uh, the um, system will actually tell you to, uh, to climb away or to descend depending on um, the encounter, but in this one, it's a climb. So now the pilot has to reach the desired vertical rate that's in um, green up there. In this case, it's uh, 1,500 feet per minute. Uh, so then the pilot will actually uh, do this maneuver to uh, safely separate from the other aircraft. And as you can see, the minus 0.3 means that the 
uh, intruding aircraft is below you um, by 300 feet, 400 feet, 500 feet. Once they've uh, reached a desired vertical separation, uh, it'll tell the pilot to level off uh, the aircraft because it doesn't need to deviate from its previous um, path as much. And then uh, when the uh, closest point of, of approach has passed, uh, the pilot will get a clear of conflict, uh, which means that the entire encounter is over and they can return to normal flight. So under the uh, FAA's NextGen initiative, uh, the ACAS-X program was formed. So ACAS-X, which stands for Next Generation Airborne Collision Avoidance System, is meant to replace TCAS for a number of reasons. Um, the NextGen initiative uh, is leveraging new surveillance and uh, navigation capabilities. So uh, it's tough to, um, to update TCAS to, to meet these requirements. Um, and because we're given a, a, a chance to start over, we uh, can improve the development cycle of this system itself. And this is where Julia comes in uh, very heavily. So ACASX supports next-gen procedures to allow aircraft to uh, fly closer together. So I want to focus now on uh, two main differences. The, um, between ACASX and TCAS. Uh, one thing about the new system is you can have an asynchronous amount of surveillance sources. So GPS is fairly new and isn't supported by TCAS. Um, uh, radar can come in as well and, and a multiple other different sources. As well as we have this optimized logic table. So we uh, generate this using dynamic programming uh, offline and what this allows us to do is update the system pretty easily because we just have to import a new table. And I'll explain that a little bit too. So our focus for development at Lincoln Laboratory is uh, on this ACAS-X processor. So it's split up into two different modules. Um, the surveillance and tracking module, or the STM, it'll uh, get an estimate of the state distribution for both the own aircraft and all the intruding aircraft in the airspace. Uh, it'll send those estimates over to the threat resolution module. And the uh, threat resolution module, or TRM, will uh, look up within these uh, optimized logic tables, uh, the future states of each aircraft, as well as the optimal action uh, in order to uh, resolve any conflict. And then again, that just gets sent to a pilot display. And the pilot display is the exact same one that TCAS uses now, so it's really just a, a plug-in of um, ACAS-X. So I'm not gonna go too far into the details of uh, the system itself. This is as far as I'm gonna go, but what's important is you know, we've developed the system, we've uh, run a lot of analysis on it, now how do we transfer this to industry? Um, to explain that a little bit, I have to explain how uh, Lincoln Laboratory uh, develops and how they, they uh, have the process of a development cycle. So, um, like a lot of projects, you do some research, you see what's out there for technology that's already available, uh, and then you start to prototype these things, um, and you have a, a feedback loop while you're prototyping with users testing it, um, and your own, your own tests on it as well, and then once you're done and you have a system you'd like to deploy into the, into the industry, you have to actually um, trans, uh, tech transfer that to industry. And so that, that tech transfer part is the, um, is the kind of the low hanging fruit where we can really solve a lot of issues. Um, historically, um, the way that these, were, these algorithms were transferred were through a um, specification document with pseudocode in English. Um, and the historic process has already proved to be uh, costly and error prone. And I'm here today to promote Julia as um, a standard for avionics uh, specification. So now I want to talk about those specification documents themselves. So um, there's two main um, issues that, uh, uh, that we have to take into account when actually building this specification. Um, one is actually writing the specs. So Lincoln Laboratory's um, job is to publish this specification and there's a lot of room for improvement in this. Um, we want to minimize the time it takes to actually write the document and minimize um, the time it takes away from development itself. And we also want, it, uh, we want the document to be easily tested uh, and evaluated on so we know that what we're publishing is in fact what we've ran our analysis on. And then on the other side, uh, we want the vendors to be able to implement this pretty quickly. So um, they want to take the document, implement it onto avionics, hardware and be able to um, read it without any confusion, um, no confusion in the algorithms or the text and no, no perceived gaps um, in what to implement. So uh, TCAS, uh, the current system, it has its specification 
uh, and it represents the logic in a few different ways. Um, here it represents it in pseudocode. Uh, one is an English descriptive pseudocode, so it actually tells you uh, in English what, what it's doing. The other is a variable-based pseudocode. Um, so already you have two representations of the logic um, that you publish, and it's tough to um, maintain the differences between the two. And clearly it's pseudocode in both cases, so you can't test it. Um, and this was the original representation of the TCAS algorithms. So because there was perceived gaps in those two, uh, an additional form of the logic was um, released, which are called state charts. This is just another way to represent the algorithms themselves. And uh, so now there's three ways to represent um, a set of algorithms, and there are three uh, distinct ways. So you can take these state charts, and you don't even need the pseudocode, and you can implement the system, but there could be some differences between um, both implementations. So now to the, to the good stuff. I'm here to uh, tell you why we've chosen Julia to replace pseudocode. I mean, the easiest uh, rationale for us to, uh, to sell is that we're replacing a custom pseudocode with a technical co computing language that's fit for the problem we're trying to solve. Um, and so we want to adhere to some of the vendor's needs. So because Julia is uh, very easy to understand, it's a concise and it's a very familiar syntax, uh, this helps the reader um, uh, actually read this document uh, with clarity and it helps the writers uh, develop algorithms that are concise. Um, and because it's this technical computing language that's highly documented online, uh, there should be no ambiguity in the code itself. If there's a question as to uh, what it's doing, uh, you either can look up um, within the document, we'll have some notation or some conventions that we use, or you can just look up on the Julia docs for that specific version of Julia to get uh, more details on what's going on. And as we write this specification, we may want to add things uh, to the language that don't already exist. And because it's open source, this gives us that capability. And we've worked with Jeff for almost two years now um, to uh, support these needs. Uh, and because it's free, this allows us to jump, th uh, to not have to jump through any license hoops when we distribute our uh, software to our collaborators to have them test. So with that in mind, we want to be able to test our specification to make sure that what we're publishing is, in fact, our code. And um, a simple but important fact that Julia is executable it really uh, gives us this ability. So we want to be able to just uh, produce a set of test cases automatically. And I'll show you a few, uh, I'll show you a framework that does this for us. Um, and then with those test cases, we want to run it back through the system and make sure that there's no imprecision or uh, ambiguities in the results. And because Julia is platform independent for results, then this uh, meets our needs in that respect. So as we develop the system, we want to, we want to maximize uh, our productivity. And uh, we have uh, simulation frameworks in place, and we want to be able to plug Julia into that and, um, and not have to slow down our uh, development process. And because Julia is high performance and it's comparable to C, uh, this allows us to just easily um, plug it into our surveillance frameworks and run it, no problem, and I'll show some benchmarks later. Um, and because the specification document itself is split up by algorithm, uh, this gives us uh, a, good, a good way to just test each algorithm, just throw it in the REPL, and you can um, send some inputs and debug it that way. So this also helps for their, um, development on our side, but as well as uh, vendors who want to see um, what the Julia code is doing. And lastly, once we've simulated these results, once we've tested a few algorithms, we just want to be able to display it, and Julia has a, a set of nice graphing libraries that does this for us. So ultimately, Julia is the right answer for us, and it meets, yet exceeds all our needs. Um, so this is the document itself. Uh, it's an algorithm design description, or the ADD. Uh, what it includes is a high-level English description of the algorithms, uh, and then a low-level uh, Julia implementation of those algorithms. Uh, this is meant to be published and transferred to industry so that they take this and they can implement the software uh, on avionics hardware. Um, and so far, it's provided early feedback because we've had flight tests over the last couple years. So we actually give this document to Johns Hopkins APL, and they'll develop, rather, they'll implement the system based on that spec. So already we've gotten some feedback um, to fix this uh, this process before we actually publish and, and go through any of that mess. And um, it also includes some data flow diagrams, which I'll show you, and um, a description of what parameters go into the system, as well as some notation algorithmic conventions to keep everything uh, contained within this document. 
So how we actually produce this is through an auto-generate framework that's written purely in Julia. Uh, so it takes Julia source files as well as um, LaTeX files that, that have an English description of uh, the Julia code. And run it through this auto-generate framework. It'll translate the Julia code to LaTeX and, ni and nicely format it. It'll produce these data flow diagrams and also build a reference table so you can see in the document where each algorithm, where each type is used. Um, and then it just uh, exports a nice uh, LaTeX PDF that we, can, um, that we can use. Some of the features of this document itself um, are, so this is a, an example of one of the algorithms, uh, the proximity estimation. So we have an English description above and then we have the Julia code itself. So this is, this is the only representation, rather these two um, blocks are the only representation of the algorithms. Uh, one describes it in detail and the other shows you exactly what to implement. Um, and, as, and if you can note, there's some um, relationship between the two where you can, um, you can reference line numbers if you want to talk about specific lines of code to, to explain a little bit further. And we let LaTeX manage those so we don't have to go through and, and do it by hand. And again, that's an error. Uh, error-prone uh, process that we want to avoid. And as you can tell, everything in here that's in blue is a hyperlink in the LaTeX document. So you, you can easily just traverse through the document and, uh, whoop, and you, can get, uh, you can just get around uh, pretty quickly. And as you can see, if you don't have a digital copy of this, you can just um, go through the page numbers as well. And again, that's all managed by LaTeX, so we want to do that. So I told you before that we take a Julia code and a LaTeX file, but we've actually transitioned to a better format where uh, we actually embed the LaTeX within uh, the Julia code. So what this does is um, we can write uh, our English description alongside our algorithms. So if you update your algorithm, it's staring you right in the face to update the description. So there's going to be no uh, discontinuity between the two. Um, and like I mentioned before, we can have labels in the text. So we just label this line that we want to reference up here. We talk about it in the paragraph itself and let the tech manage all that stuff. So if you may have noticed, we heavily type our algorithms um, for a few reasons. One, it gives us a speed increase when we're uh, running it through our simulation framework. But more importantly, it explicitly tells the vendors what to expect for type and size of each input and output in the variables within the functions themselves. Um, and within, uh, those types, we, we make use of uh, composite types heavily, again, just for clarity of the system. Um, but within those, all the subfields are typed just for, uh, for uh, the expectation of what to, uh, what to see. And now I mentioned that we can automatically generate these data flow diagrams. Uh, so the color didn't come out as well as I hoped, but uh, we utilize Julia's meta, uh, meta programming to get an AST of uh, specific algorithms of choice. And what it'll do is it'll walk through and look for interesting assignments. And in this case, uh, it found four different um, algorithms that share some inputs and outputs. And it'll show you that relationship in this diagram. And again, this is all automatically generated. So it technically is some representation of, of the, the logic and the system. Um, but those, if you change a variable name or change any function names or remove any of those, uh, it'll update it as you just hit Enter. So there's no, there's no need to, to maintain that. Um, that difference. So now I want to talk about how we've incorporated Julia in our simulation frameworks and some benchmarks with that. So we have a simulation framework called CSIM, which stands for Collision Avoidance Simulation. Uh, it's written in MATLAB, and I'll tell you now, if Julia was born when uh, we started this, it would have been written in Julia. Um, but a, a good note is uh, Michael Kokendifer at the Stanford Intelligent Systems Laboratory has a similar framework to this that's written purely in Julia. Um, so we have a development uh, logic that's written in C++. Um, and the reason for this is we, we use it as an experimentation logic. Uh, and again, this started before Julia came out. Um, so we are able to call both our development logic as well as our um, Julia logic alongside each other. And having two um, logics internally allows us to validate one. So when we're running some tests on the development logic or making some changes, we also make those changes to the Julia, which is the specification, and then we just um, run them together and make sure that they match. And we uh, utilize a um, pre-compiled Julia binary, and we wrap that in a uh, shared library. So we just can call this common libacast interface, and, and the simulation framework doesn't know any, any difference between C++ or Julia. We just plug those in pretty nicely. And then we can just uh, output or uh, export this to uh, PyPlot, 
seen here, and you can get some good visualizations of you know, where the two aircraft were flying for the ground track. You can get the advisory, so they got a climb advisory, and you can see the altitude um, of one of the aircraft's uh, rows, and, and then they get a clear of conflict. So um, I mentioned we use a Julia precompiled binary. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the, uh, the language itself uh, gets shipped with a system image or, or this precompiled uh, base library for Julia. Um, so we just leverage that fact and we include our ACASX Julia algorithms alongside the uh, Julia base library. And then we produce this ACASX shared library. And this gives us a speed increase on startup. Um, but for us, it's important because when we distribute this uh, shared library to our collaborators, we want to make sure that the, uh, the results they're getting are exactly what we ran so that none of the source code can be changed. Um, and so that if there's any differences, it's something other than uh, the logic itself. So the, uh, the source versus the binary gives us a little speed increase. And again, this is mainly on the, um, on the startup cost. So I ran a million encounters uh, on our Elogrid parallel computing cluster. Um, using 512 cores. And uh, our original goal was to have our specification language be within a factor of two for speed uh, compared to our C++ implementation. And as you can see, uh, we're about a factor of 1.5 for both of them. So this meets, rather exceeds our needs in this respect. So Julia, because it's fast, allows us to validate our entire system um, before we release it. So now I want to talk uh, briefly about some other uses of Julia uh, that um, our collaborators have put together, and uh, specifically in verification and validation tools. Um, so this example from Johns Hopkins APL uh, is uh, called ASIM. So what it does is it takes the precompiled Julia binary, and it'll compare it against um, what the vendor implements. So this actually gets released uh, to vendors as a form of uh, validation that their implementation matches what the specification document uh, intends. Um, another example, uh, this comes from the Stanford Intelligence Systems Laboratory, along with Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie Mellon Silicon Valley, and NASA. Uh, they've built a framework for adaptive stress testing. And so what their goal is to uh, find the most likely failures of the system. So they use a Monte Carlo tree search algorithm uh, to uh, seed into this black box simulation. And uh, they get output, a log likelihood, and a metric associated with that. Uh, likelihood. And again, this entire framework is written in Julia. And uh, once you actually uh, stop the simulation, um, and for Monte Carlo tree search, it's an anytime algorithm, so you can stop it at any time to see what failures come out. You can plot them, and uh, in this case, they use uh, PGF plots uh, to generate those visualizations. Another example, and this comes from uh, APL, is a theorem proving uh, for safety analysis framework. So what they use Julia for is to uh, compute a uh, exhaustive search over um, 650 billion decision points within the optimized logic table. So what this is trying to find is parts of the table specifically, not the system as a whole, where uh, failures occurred. Um, and they originally did some studies in MATLAB, and this would have taken years for them. And um, they utilize uh, a type of uh, electrical closure to, as they say, precompile these functions before they actually run their simulations. And uh, I think they may be able to uh, leverage some of the staged functions that were previously uh, talked about. Another example uh, from APL is this probabilistic model checker. So uh, what it does is it'll take a regular expression of a Markov decision process query. And uh, in this case, it uh, takes the expression of uh, there was an action to the pilot or an advisory to the pilot. Uh, then there was a clear conflict, meaning the encounter was over. And then there was another action given. And so that's something that we want to uh, resolve entirely from the system. It does happen, but this framework um, is able to pinpoint those uh, throughout the system. And they use Julia to search all 10 to the 70th uh, paths uh, through the MDP. And uh, they actually have a sparse matrix that's six terabytes. Um, and they actually can efficiently iterate over that. Um, and they use the parallel package, um, or the parallel uh, macro, rather, uh, quite a bit for that. Um, but something that they do want to see is a debugger for the parallel workers themselves. Um, and I think, you know, we're looking at you. <laughs> but uh, also, we want uh, to be able to debug the macro expanded code, which is something a lot of people could, 
could benefit from. Um, and lastly, I want to talk about a, a weakest precondition tool that, again, comes from APL. Uh, what it does is it's, uh, it's meant to get branch coverage of the Julia code itself. So you just annotate the Julia code, run it through a preprocessor that gets the abstract uh, syntax tree, and then that'll run through an OCaml um, weakest precondition tool, which generates these sets of uh, concrete inputs that satisfy your uh, annotations. And again, this is good, too, because we can really stretch uh, the breadth and the depth of the system to make sure we're covering all ground. OK, so I went a little fast, but what did I, what did I uh, go over today? Well, Julia really resolves many of our conflicts with writing the specification itself. Um, and it's expected to reduce the cost during tech transfer. And already, we've um, proven that with flight tests and um, transferring this to other organizations and having them implement it from the document. Uh, because Julia is fast, uh, it enables us to um, run the entire system. And more importantly, it allows uh, the system, um, or rather the specification, to be executed directly. Uh, and this is important. Like I mentioned, I can't stress enough that what we're publishing is, in fact, what we've ran our years of analysis on. Um, and we leverage the Julia precompiled binary to uh, protect the source when we distribute it, as well as to get some speed, uh, speed boost there. And I mentioned that we use Julia throughout a, a variety of tasks, not just the ACASX core system and its specification, um, but our automatic document generation framework, as well as uh, some verification and validation tools. Um, and so some future work that we're planning is um, to incorporate the Julia logic into our tuning framework. Um, so right now we tune our C++ logic and then uh, through uh, specific parameters, um, we'd like to tune our Julia logic so uh, that the final system um, use Julia to, uh, to tune against. And so this bullet here is actually kind of interesting. Uh, we, uh, we've experimented a lot with the precompiled binary, and we ran into some issues early on. Uh, Jamison Nash, who's not here, but he helped us out quite a bit um, with getting the precompiled binary working. Uh, but then we had this uh, problem with interfacing uh, to MATLAB. And uh, we've had this problem since about November. And uh, we'd see these random seg faults uh, and uh, Heisenbugs, as, as I like to call them, because it would just quit out. L luckily, uh, this past Tuesday, a few days ago, Jameson uh, came into the lab, and, and Jeff was there as well. And uh, we resolved this issue that's been hanging over us for a while. So now we have uh, a great path forward to use Julia throughout our, um, throughout our simulation frameworks and, and to really stress it um, in that respect. And now. Uh, we're just going to continue to push Julia as a standard for specifications, uh, specifically in the avionics industry. Um, and then uh, in August of this year, we have a, another flight test um, where it'll be a good uh, example of how useful the, uh, the uh, clarity of the Julia specification is. And I'd like to thank everyone here who's contributed this, and um, Jeff and Jameson, who've uh, given us some great consulting work, as well as the entire Julia community for doing what you guys do best. So thank you. Thank you, Robert. Do we have any questions? Yes. Was it harder to get the consumers of the spec on board with using Julia, or was that easy? So it was, it was tough at first, um, but really what I've shown you is, is the way we've uh, tried to frame it, is uh, if we're going to redo the system, in its entirety on the technical side, we might as well help with the development side as well. And the reason that, we, um, that we've ran into problems is because the previous uh, way of doing things was uh, very costly. Uh, so at first it was a little tough, but then uh, with the flight test that we had one in 2013, so it was a good example of giving the spec and implementing it, and it's been a breeze since then. Yes? You speak of making Julia a standard. Mm -hmm. How are such standards set upon? I mean, is there a bureaucratic process? Uh, there, there are committees that do decide these things. Um, and we're involved with a lot of those uh, committees. There's a, a RTCA, which is a, a, a worldwide committee for um, air travel standards. Uh, that's where a lot of this, um, these talks would be, uh, would be influenced by. Anyone else? The, uh, the latex stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so working at the lab, everything uh, is a little sensitive. Um, 
Right now it's not, but we can kind of pull some of the, the modules out to be able to make it open source. Yeah. It's yeah. really cool. I mean, it's kind of not the, the thrust of the work, but I mean, it's, I think it could be kind of a, it's like literate programming. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's useful not just for this, but it can be useful for a lot of other things, yeah. Do you want to describe roughly the size of the system, lines of code, number of types, to get a sense for how big it is? That's a good question. Um, and how many people, I mean, you have also credit to the entire team. Yeah. So um, only a few of those people actually touch the Julia code itself. Um, we keep it kind of um, safe just because it's, it's what we're going to publish. Um, so as to go back to your original question, which was, sorry, I didn't res or, uh, uh, reciprocate any of these, but um, the size of our code base, uh, I think we have about uh, 200 different algorithms um, with maybe 30 different types, something like that. Um, different custom types, and uh, the, the organizations that we work with are, are pretty extensive. So there's probably over uh, 100 people that work together on this as a whole, and that's, that's both the development of the system plus some analysis for external uh, collaborators. So there is, some, there is some talk on that, actually putting, so the, the question was, what are the chances of having Julia not just be a reference, but actually fly on the aircraft themselves? So there, there has been talk of that. It's not, it's not a crazy thought. Uh, I think the, the Julia would have to go through a, a rigorous um, uh, evaluation process, and there would have to be a good stable release for it, but uh, this is, I guess, this the, the beginning work to something like that. Um, but at, right now, that's not what we're, we're pushing entirely, but I'd like to see that, of course. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, thank you, everybody.